Let me see here. Door closed. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you to be here at the Full Armor Apologetics YouTube channel. Do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, to it today, we I have a very special guest. Um, as the title already says, this is about the Shroud of Turin. Uh, but the man right here in front of me is is uh, multi talented, if, if I may say. He's not only a specialist in the Shroud, but he's also a specialist in uh, the scientific evidences of God and uh, uh, the Eucharistic miracles. So, Father Robert Spitzer, thank you first of all for being here with us today. Oh, it's very good to be with you, Vartan. Thank you. Thank you very much. So could you uh, give us a summation for the people who don't know you, who you are, uh, what it is that you do, and why it is that you do what you do? Sure. I'm uh, Father Robert Spitzer, as you have said. I, uh, I'm the president of the Maja Center of Reason and Faith. Uh, we put together um, all kinds of things, books and articles, uh, um, uh, also school uh, programs for high school and middle school, collegiate programs, uh, websites in the areas of uh, science-based apologetics, um, especially uh, we look at uh, the evidence uh, for God uh, from contemporary cosmology and astrophysics. We also look at um, the evidence for a soul, uh, not only from um, uh, medical studies of near-death experiences, but also uh, medical studies of terminal lucidity and uh, intelligence in hydrocephalic patients. We also look at the um, evidence for Jesus Christ, uh, science-based evidence for Jesus, and especially uh, uh, in that regard, the Shroud of Turin is particularly important. And uh, as you will see, um, that this is... Uh, this is a relic, I believe, which is quite authentic, and there's a preponderance of evidence uh, that shows it to be so, and we can discuss that fully uh, during uh, this webinar. Also, um, I look into the Eucharistic miracles, as Vartan was just saying, and in addition to that, um, I look at Marian miracles, look at contemporary uh, healings, uh, but basically always with an eye to the scientific investigation a contemporary scientific investigation uh, of all of these things that really shows the uh, the um, complementarity between faith and science. So if you're looking, for example, for some of our stuff, uh, you can take a look at magiscenter.com. That's M-A-G-I-S center.com. American spelling of center, C-E-N-T-E-R. So magicenter.com. And you can also take a look at uh, my various books on uh, Amazon or even on our own website, et cetera. Excellent. So in a nutshell said, you are specializing in, in the sense of science, scientific proofs. Like in this day mm -hmm. and age, proofs are scientific evidences are very are regarded in a very high manner. And that's something that you uh, obviously give a high... Um, I credit you. Mm -hmm. um, for anybody who is doing apologetics in general, um, mm -hmm. if, if you look at the Shroud of Turn or hear, some, hear something about it in a general sense, like you automatically like sit up straight and like your, your ears are like sparked up a bit. Mm -hmm. You're like, wait, what? And, and then, um, so so it, it, is a, it is a very fun subject. Um, I had a, a couple of years ago, I bought this book called the, uh, the Truth About the Shroud of Turin, Solving the Mystery by Robert K. Wilcox. And oh, yeah. Some, I guess you're from already familiar with it. Yes. Um, one of the beautiful things that already has uh, amazing uh, pictures. And so what, what we're going to do basically today is that in, um, let me see, in Matthew 27, 57 to 60, it says right here in the Bible, uh, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it down in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So, and here's an excellent... Uh, 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 iconography, a uh, portrait of the shroud. 
So basically what we're going to do by, by God's grace and with the help of our father right here that the shroud that's laying there right now in turn is the actual shroud that our Lord has resurrected in literally speaking. So mm -hmm. my, my initial question would be, um, Father, what can you tell us about the history of the shroud? Like how old is it? Where did it came from for the past 2000 years? Where did it went? Okay. Um, the first thing to do is to talk about that 1988 carbon dating and to dispel it uh, because it has been debunked by five different um, uh, scientific uh, investigations. So uh, you might have heard that in 1988, three labs, uh, one at Oxford, one at Zurich, and one here in the United States and Arizona, uh, those three labs uh, basically showed, um, quote unquote, that the shroud originated uh, maybe sometime between 1250 to 1350, uh, right in that neighborhood, which would mean essentially that the shroud is essentially 700 years old. Um, and um, uh, that caused a great deal of, you know, um, you know, dis well, people were dismayed uh, to, to, to say the least, uh, because there was so much other corroborating evidence for the authenticity of the shroud. Well, eventually it turned out that this uh, test was uh, invalid indeed. One of the first uh, problems um, that was unearthed was Dr. Ray Rogers, uh, who is, uh, you know, a thermal uh, chemist. Um, and at that time, he, he was the uh, uh, head of uh, a very prestigious journal of uh, thermal chemi uh, chemistry called uh, Thermochimica. Um, they're out of the um, uh, national lab in the USA National Lab. Uh, in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Uh, the, the main thing uh, that he discovered um, uh, in doing all of this uh, was that uh, um, the, the shroud sample came from a very controversial corner of the shroud. And it, uh, it was one that was actually harmed by the fire of Chambéry in the 1500s. And some sisters actually used a technique called invisible wem uh, mending uh, to, um, to reinforce the shroud um, uh, after it had been burned through by some metal that had uh, melted and, and uh, penetrated the, the material. And so they actually wove it together with this technique called invisible wet, um, uh, mending. Well, obviously material um, was, uh, was reintroduced into that controversial place. Now, why the sample was taken from there and only from there is a mystery to everyone uh, involved in shroud research. I mean, this is the most controversial place on the shroud you could have taken a sample from. It was taken from that place right next to a place where the, the, the shroud was burned through. But very luckily, um, there were a lot of samples taken from near that place on the sticky tapes from the 1978 STIRP investigation. And Dr. Um, Ray Rogers, as I just uh, said, Dr. Ray Rogers got a hold of these samples, actually examined them, and found cotton fibers, and even an abundance of cotton fibers uh, in the fibrils uh, on the sticky tapes uh, that were taken from the place where the, uh, the actual strand was taken for the sample. Now, uh, once uh, that those were identified with cotton fibers, uh, as you know, the the, 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 the shroud is linen, it comes from flax, a uh, very different material. Um, but um, the problem, of course, is that you would have then material blended with it, right, that is from the meat, the Middle Ages, and you would not have um, uh, purely the flax, the, uh, the, the, the linen material uh, from which the shroud was actually constructed. So you're going to have um, for sure heterogeneity uh, in, in the shroud, if, if Dr. Rogers is correct. By the way, he used all of the latest techniques of mass spectrometry, et cetera, um, uh, to do this and chemical pyrolysis to do this. So he was very certain that there were, uh, there was an admixture of both uh, linen and cotton. And even on the cotton, um, uh, you know, there's remnants of a, a gum dye mordant. That, in other words, the, those cotton fibers that were used by the sisters to mend it, uh, they had a, a dye in them uh, that was only available in Europe starting with the 1100s. So obviously there's much later material uh, entered in. Now we skip uh, to uh, 2017, 2018, uh, when Dr. Uh, Tristan uh, Casabianca 
remember now that one of the labs that, that looked at the, the shroud was Oxford uh, University. Well, um, they have a very prestigious journal called Archaeometry, one of the very finest um, uh, journals uh, on archaeology um, and, uh, in, well, in the world. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, Tristan Casabianca, after making finally a legal request, right, a, 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 you know, freedom of information request, finally, after multiple requests of the British Museum, the British Museum finally released the uh, raw data from the carbon dating. Uh, Tristan uh, Kaspianka and his team then got to work on it. And after, you know, it was, you know, the, the statistical analysis of, of that raw data was completed, it was absolutely certain that there was heterogeneity, not only among the three. So it was a single strand was taken. It was split into three parts. And then they were those each part was sent to a different lab, as I said, you know, Oxford and Xerxes, et cetera. So the main thing is then you have these three parts, but there was heterogeneity between uh, the uh, samples and within the samples. And as it turned out, though, as you move from right to left uh, on that strand, um, you know, as it, you know, okay, you take those parts, you can go from one lab to the next lab to the next lab. Moving from right to left on the shroud is you're looking at that upper corner from which the strand was taken. You can actually see that the heterogeneity is getting greater and greater. That means there's more and more of the, the later material that's being introduced into it. As a result, uh, you know, in archaeometry, Casabianca said, oh, this sample is completely unvalid invalid for testing. You can't have heterogeneity. You have to have a homogeneity of the sample because the heterogeneity indicates that there are, um, you know, cloths and materials from different periods that are now blended into that sample, which would make it invalid. Why was this hidden for all these years? Why, since the publication in 1988 of that uh, a negative result, um, you know, um, in, in Nature magazine, which is a very good peer-reviewed journal, uh, why did the British Museum not release, uh, you know, the raw data for all this time? Why did it have to wait for 30 years to 2018 to get the publication of the truth of this? I do not know. But since, uh, and, you know, that time there, uh, you know, it's not just Casabianca uh, proved that this was a very bad sample with obvious heterogeneity, obvious other, uh, you know, uh, ages of clots mixed in. But then... Um, uh, uh, Dr. Giulio Fanti and then later Dr. Uh, uh, Liberato Di Caro, um, both actually worked uh, for uh, national labs in Italy and uh, are measurement experts. Uh, they actually performed uh, four tests. Uh, Giulio Fanti um, uh, and his team uh, did uh, Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy. Uh, a Raman laser spectroscopy and a, um, a mechanical uh, compression um, and uh, a compressibility and tension test. Uh, he averaged, you know, he weighted all of them relative to the uh, weights that they would have in terms of their being affected by carbon, like being caught in a fire, there's going to be some carbon embedded in the cloth. So we weighted the samples differently because Raman laser um, uh, spectroscopy is less sensitive to carbon than, for example, Fourier uh, transformed infrared spectroscopy. But anyway, he weighted all those things together and he came up with an age of 90 AD uh, with a confidence level of about 95% plus or minus 200 years. 90 AD. That's very different from 700 years ago in 1300 AD. And then the second um, test, that uh, big one that was done, was in 2022, just last year, was done by Dr. Liberato Di Caro and his team, again, in Italian National Labs uh, there. And what he discovered, he used a new technique, which he, by the way, peer-reviewed uh, over several different um, uh, peer-reviewed journal uh, uh, journal issues where he actually showed the veracity of this new method called wide a wide angle X-ray scattering, and he and his team came up uh, after putting in the the shroud sample came up with a date for the shroud between 55 to 74 A.D. 55 to 74 A.D. with a very high confidence level um, and. Um, he added a comment at the end of his 
uh, article, uh, again, in a peer-reviewed journal, um, uh, he added this comment. He said, you know, if the shroud is only 700 years old, then the ambient secular temperature that the shroud would have had to have been stored at throughout the course of its existence would have had to have been higher than the highest temperatures on the earth throughout that entire 700 years. Now, obviously, the, you know, the shroud was not kept at burning hot conditions for 700 years, you know, over the course of its existence. So the plausibility of a 700 year old date is just absolutely ruled out at this juncture. But then, it, you know, there's more evidence that has been, um, you know, ascertained, but I won't bore you with uh, all of the pollen fossils and the, the date of the shroud, et cetera. Excellent. <clears throat> Father, if I may ask you, uh, first off, two questions. Um, how long has like, like contemporaneous scientific research been done on the shroud? Well, it's been done ever since um, uh, the time of, um, uh, uh, you know, Segundo Pia coming in and uh, um, taking the first photographs. And um, you know, what I didn't explain is that the shroud is actually a photographic negative image. In fact, as I will explain later, it's a three-dimensional photographic negative image with actual imaging of the inside of the body, like the backbone, is imaged in perfect three-dimensional proportionality to the flesh surrounding the black of uh, the backbone on the exterior. So if you look at the dorsal image, you can see um, with perfect three-dimensional uh, proportionality, the backbone itself on the inside of the body, as well as the flesh surrounding it. So it's a three-dimensional a photographic negative image. Well, Segundo Pia, uh, I think it was back in 1892, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was the first one to actually take uh, a photograph of it. And of course, he's looking at that photograph and he's going, oh my gosh, my negative image looks just like the positive image of the man on the shroud. So if you actually look at the positive image of the shroud, right, and, and you you, you you look at it straight on, you think, oh, this is like a straw man almost. It's like straw in color. It's almost, uh, you know, doesn't have all the definition. But then you look at the photographic uh, image and you can see very, very clearly that this is a, uh, a, 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 you know, a photographic negative image on the shroud. And that, of course, you know, intrigued everybody. The whole scientific establishment said, hey, we've never seen anything like this before. This is the most unique image we have uh, in the history of humankind because it's a photographic negative image that's emblazoned on a non-photographically sensitive linen cloth. How did it get there? And of course, as we shall see in a moment, it could never have been produced by chemicals or liquids or dye or scorching. There's only one way you can do this, and that is radiation. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Right. But the scientific community, the physicists on the, in the scientific community recognize right away, radiation is going to have to be uh, the cause of this. And I can explain that in a moment. But the main thing to, to look at is, as you said, when did it start? It starts right when that photographic negative image is uh, um, you know, presented to the scientific community, uh, the wonder of it, the amazement of it, the uniqueness of it uh, is so stupendous that the shroud then very quickly became the most scientifically examined historical artifact in history by far. It's the most unique image in history and it's the most scientifically examined historical artifact in history. So, um, but uh, right there when Secundo Pia took that uh, photograph, I think it was 1892, might be 1894, but um, right in that uh, neighborhood. Right. Um, you already mentioned before, I, w I watched one of your, your interviews later, you said something about cosmogenic isotopes, and later on we're going to a bit more into that mm -hmm. on that part. But my, my, my question is, of all the scientists who had to do research on the shroud, what were their worldviews? Were they atheists? Were they Buddhists? Had, did they have a dog in a fight when they did the research on the shroud? Is, is there something you could tell us about it? Yeah, I, they're all over the place, uh, that's for sure. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there certainly were agnostics that uh, that looked, uh, you know, they, uncertain about God that looked uh, at, at the shroud. 
Um, uh, certainly there were um, uh, non-Christians as well. That, let, In fact, as you know, the, the great photographer, Barry Schwartz, uh, uh, you know, was Jewish and a, a non-Christian. Uh, so there are certainly non-Christians also that, that looked at, at, at the, that examined the shroud. Um, uh, also, uh, you can see that there's a variety of different uh, uh, religious denominations uh, that are there, certainly not just restricted to Catholics. So I would say there's a variety, but uh, yes, there were certainly uh, people um, uh, there who had a dog in the fight. And there were certainly people who didn't have a dog in the fight. But I would hasten to add that it's not just um, that. The, the, the scientists like John Jackson or Ray Rogers, the scientists who looked at it, um, you know, the, uh, you know, Alan Adler and Heller, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bologna, who did all the, uh, the blood examination, et cetera, uh, various different um, religious denominations um, from Christian to Jewish uh, to agnostic. But the main thing is their scientific credentials were top notch. They were very good people, exceedingly well published people, people, you know, scientists with very high in integrity have never been questioned on a scientific level. So even if they were Christians, um, you know, they, they still, you know, frankly, um, you know, uh, we're not going to let their religious bias overcome their scientific integrity. So, I mean, but, you know, th there were people who had a dog in the fight, but there were also people who didn't have a dog in the fight. Exactly. So it, it's, we're trying to be as unbiased as possible. We're trying to right. put the, the facts and let the facts speak for themselves. So one of the very intriguing thing about the shroud is also the blood mm -hmm. and the blood stains. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about the bloodstains, Father? Yeah, the bloodstains, uh, you know, obviously are blood. There are 372 bloodstains on the shroud. And uh, all of those bloodstains, um, you know, have um, what we call AB blood type. Uh, it has been found out that, uh, um, but not from the shroud um, blood, uh, that there, uh, Jesus probably was uh, AB negative. So he has an RH negative um, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 blood type, but right on the shroud, we can see the AB pl blood type as, uh, you know, as, as, uh, commonly as ever. Number two, uh, it has a human hemoglobin. Clearly then it's from a human being, you know, these molecules that are carrying oxygen, right? The hemoglobin, uh, are, are obviously from a human being. It also has human immunoglobulins. It has human bilirubin. And that's what gives, uh, uh, sometimes blood that uh, uh, right, uh, red character uh, to it, among other things. It also has a series of other um, uh, human, uh, verifiable uh, human qualities without getting into too much technicality. It's indisputably blood. Let's face it, dyes and paints and all kinds of things like that simply don't have blood type, hemoglobin, immunoglobulins, bilirubin, et cetera. But more than that, the blood also presents a series of paradoxes in three different ways. Number one, you can actually see that um, uh, there's kind of a synthesis of two enzymes, uh, you know, ferritin and creatinin, um, in the uh, in the blood stains on the shroud. Now, those two enzymes generally get uh, synthesized and uh, emerge as a, you know a dominant presence within the blood when a body is experiencing a heavy polytrauma. So in other words, it looks very certain that this man was tortured, not just because of the obvious wounds that you can see from his the whipping and the spear and so forth. You know, it's very clear that this, the blood on the cloth, um, you know, was, um, uh, was emitted by a man who had undergone polytraumas. Now, if a medieval forger could have actually figured this out, which of course he couldn't, he didn't even know what ferritin and creatinine were, uh, you know, that, uh, that would be uh, uh, surprising indeed. You can also see on the bloodstains, you can see a vertical axis um, separation between the plasma, um, you know, that, that kind of stays in place. And then the blood serum, which is going down, it's oriented downward on a vertical axis. So you, the, it's very probable that this body was hanging. 
can, of course, prove that it was hanging from a cross, but the evidence from the nail prints on the hands, et cetera, would suggest this uh, very definitely. But definitely that body was oriented uh, vertically uh, for quite some time because the serum is separating from the plasma along the vertical axis. Furthermore, the last thing I'll just say about the blood um, is that uh, those blood stains, they appear on the shroud before the image. Now, you would think that if a forger were doing this, right, a forger would put the image there so he could place those blood stains with perfect anatomical accuracy, he could place those on the shroud. So, um, you know, accurately. So, but that's not what happened. The blood stains went on the shroud first. And there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, and the reason is, is that when the body is placed in the shroud, you just read from Matthew 27, when the body is uh, placed into the tomb, it's put on the shroud. Now, wrapping does not mean wrapping like a mummy, where it goes, the wrapping goes around the body. Wrapping, that word wrapping, means the longitudinal wrapping. That is to say, the body is laid on the dorsal part of the shroud, then the shroud is taken. It's a 14-foot shroud and it's pulled over the head of the man and then brought down to the feet of the man on the frontal part of the shroud. And that's what the wrapping means. Now, when that body is laid there, it is filled with those blood stains. And the dorsal part is getting the blood stains imprinted because of the heaviness of the body. But then the body is also, uh, the shroud is also on top of uh, the body, getting the frontal blood stains imprinted on it right when it gets into the tomb. However, when you've got the um, um, the resurrection, right, the image, the image comes later. And as I said, there's very good evidence that the radiation is the method by which, um, you know, the body is actually, um, uh, you know, emits, you know, this, this radiation. I'm going to favor the particle radiation hypothesis rather than the ultraviolet radiation hypothesis. But nevertheless, that radiation had to come before rigor mortis, um, you know, firmly set in. So it had to come, let's just say, at least, uh, let's say, 24 to 36 hours after the body was laid in the tomb then suddenly you have a burst of radiation uh, in this non, you know, fully rigor mortis body. But the main thing to, to notice is that, um, you know, in the uh, blood stains, you can actually, you know, through uh, various forms of, um, you know, x-ray imaging, you can actually see beneath the blood stains to the cloth. Now, the, as we'll see, as I talk about it later, the radiation causes crispiness on the shroud. In other words, what's causing the image is that the shroud material is turning crispy. We call it friability. So that there's a friability all along where the image is. The more crispiness there is, the darker the image becomes. So, of course, the body would have been closer. The radiation levels would have been higher uh, the closer it is. That's why you get that perfect three-dimensional imaging, um, and as we'll see both in, from inside and outside the body. Now, if you can actually look, you know, and see by x-ray, um, you know, uh, imaging, you can actually see, aha, there's no friability under that blood. Well, if there's no friability, there's no crispiness under the blood, what does that mean? It means that the blood went on the shroud before the image. And that's exactly what we think happened. The body was placed in the shroud. The blood made contact with the shroud almost immediately. Then somewhere 24 to 36 hours later, bingo. You've got this huge burst of radiation um, that produces the image and the body is gone. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's uh, if the, the blood is absolutely authentic. And I'll just point out those blood stains relative to the image are so accurately portray the crucifixion account in the Gospels um, that I mean, it's it's like the Gospels not only verify the shroud, the shroud verifies the Gospels. I mean, it's almost a perfect correlation with the accounts we read in the gospel narratives of the Absolutely. crucifixion. Thank you. Um, so so the, the burst of radiation that you mentioned before, if you'd like to elaborate more, mm -hmm. what, what was necessary in order for that type of burst of radiation to put that image on the shroud? 
Yeah. Um, the main thing uh, is, uh, and I'll, um, um, I'll just say this. You can see on the shroud, see all the, the, the body di did not touch all the parts of the shroud. There is imaging in places, say in the eye sockets and, you know, any, you know, deep uh, gulf on the uh, surface of the body. There's imaging and certainly the imaging from the inside of the body. The cloth was not touching the inside of the body per se. So where did that come from? It has to come from radiation because radiation can what we call act at a distance. So it doesn't have the imaging doesn't have to touch. I mean, the uh, shroud doesn't have to touch the body to get the image. Radiation moves outward and can actually have um, uh, effects at a distance. And we call that action at a distance. In fact, you could define radiation as action at a distance, right? Uh, physical effects that are emitted at a distance. So we, we knew basically from the time, um, you know, uh, we, 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 could, we could certainly eliminate the, um, the uh, um, liquids and dyes and so forth right away because right um, the image on the shroud is on the uppermost surface of the of the fibrils right and so uh, you know if you used a liquid to try and make that image or a rub or a dye <clears throat> or vapors that were emitted from the um, from the body all of those things would have seeped into the middle of the fibers and seeped into the um, middle of the cloth. But the image uh, uh, producing producer did not seep uh, into the middle of the medulla of the fibers, the middle of the fibers, or the middle of the cloth. So it eliminates right away liquids and dyes and vapors and so forth. Scorching, there's a very easy test, a fluorescing test, uh, to, to see whether scorching was done. Of course, the fluorescing test turned out negative. No scorching was done. The only possible thing when you combine action at a distance and you combine uh, the uppermost surface of the fibrils and about four or five other uh, characteristics, you can see radiation is the only, only possible explanation for how that happened. So how, you said, how did such a burst of, of radiation occur? Um, you need a very specialized kind of radiation you're gonna need what's called columnated radiation. That is to say, that's going right up in straight lines. So if you could just imagine the body lying there, the radiation is gonna to have to go up quite vertically, but quite straight, and of course, um, uh, you know, hit that uh, shroud with equal levels of int intensity, which would only vary according to the distance that the body lies from the shroud. And the, the closer it is, the darker, will be the image because of the friability, the increased friability of the clock. Okay, so you look at that and you go, okay, what could have done that? One method, and by the way, this is done by John Jackson and his team, um, and, and it was validated by Paolo Di Lassero, um, again, another uh, um, a physicist and um, at the uh, Italian National Labs. Uh, John Jackson's a, a physicist here, um, formerly from uh, Los Alamos, um, uh, labs um, um, here in the United States. But anyway, the, the main thing is um, uh, they came up with a theory and validated that theory that uh, what we call <clears throat> columnated vacuum ultraviolet radiation could have been the source of that image. And it's a very valid thing. As I said, Paolo Di Lazzaro has um, uh, you know, uh, certainly validated it. So from that point of view, uh, we can pretty much say that is one possibility that's been verified, except that, as we'll see in just a moment, there are 42 enigmas on the image of, of, of the Shroud of Turin, uh, the image of the man on the Shroud of Turin, 42 of them. 21 of them are explained by the uh, columnated vacuum ultraviolet radiation. 21 of them are not explained. Uh, uh, 21 of those enigmas are not explained by that theory. Therefore, another theory was uh, generated called the particle radiation hypothesis, which I'll explain in a moment. The main thing to remember about the, uh, uh, the particle radiation hypothesis is, first of all, it explains how the image could have, from the inside of the body, could have made it to the surface of the body. You've got an automatic explanation of that. The second thing is, is that the particle radiation hypothesis 
also explains all 42 enigmas of the image and the blood on the shroud. I'll just give you a few examples in just a moment of what the particle radiation hypothesis does. So this uh, currently, in my view, is um, um, uh, is, uh, is the better theory. Uh, you, the involvement of several physicists there, uh, Dr. Kitty Little um, uh, is a primary physicist. She's at the Harwell um, Nuclear Labs there in um, uh in uh, London, in um, in uh, Great Britain, uh, you've also got uh, Jean Baptiste uh, Renaudo. Uh, he's at the the uh, uh, I believe uh, it's the French Scientific uh, uh, Polytechnique uh, um, there in Paris. Um, and uh, uh, then you have Dr. Arthur Lind uh, here in the United States. Uh, those are three of the uh, uh, principal investigators of that uh, particle radiation hypothesis. As I said, I prefer this for a variety of reasons. Let me try to explain what the particle radiation hypothesis is and then get back to the cosmogenic isotopes that you just asked me about. Yes, fine. The main thing to remember um, is that um, with the particle radiation hypothesis, it's not like radiation is coming. By the way, I should mention this. If the ultraviolet radiation hypothesis is correct, then the blast of radiation that would be required would be six to eight billion, that's with a B, billion watts of light energy. Now that would be for one forty billionth of a second, which is a very small amount of time. You can only produce that with what we call eczema ARF lasers, right, um, in a laboratory right now. But six to eight billion watts of light energy, why that would be the same as like taking 500,000, um, a, a half a million, uh, a searchlight's worth of light energy and blinking that huge amount of light energy for only one forty billionth of a second so that it would give rise to the most remarkable, perfect imaging, uh, three-dimensional um, uh, imaging um, uh, that you could get. But of course, if you exceed one forty billionth of a second, it would have burned the entire shroud. I mean, you wouldn't even have carbon smoke left over uh, after burning like that. So you got to make sure it's for a very short blip. But in fact, as I said, uh, uh, Dr. Paolo Di uh, Lazzaro and his team did validate that. Now, the main uh, that it's a possible way of producing the image. But um, again, that would be a miracle right then and there. Now, the particle radiation hypothesis uh, is not like a blast of radiation, 68 billion watts in that uh, sense. But what it requires is what's called a um, nuclear disintegration, a low temperature uh, nuclear reaction is going to occur. Low temperature nuclear reaction occurs when you have um, the constituent particles uh, in stable atomic nuclei, they start disintegrating, right? So now here's the thing to remember. A low temperature nuclear reaction will not get to such a high temperature that it's going to, you know, basically blow the, the shroud up. Uh, it's low temperature. So its effects are not going to destroy the, the shroud. What's causing the image, what's causing the friability of the surface of the cloth are the fact <clears throat> that particles are being emitted from the body. <clears throat> so in this hypothesis, what happens is, you know, there are seven octillion, right? Seven octillion. You know, uh, that, that's a, you know, a lot of billion, 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 trillion, 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 trillion right? So that's, you know, you got seven octillion perfectly stable atomic nuclei that are constituting this body. Now, they are going to sim simultaneously start disintegrating into their particle constituents. So there's going to be two flows of particles coming out of every place on uh, the, sh uh, the shroud man's body. So if you look at that, you can just imagine one flow of particles is what we will call um, uh, pro heavy charged particles. And the majority of those heavy charged particles are what we call protons, deuterons, etc. Now those positively charged particles there's going to, I mean, we're talking about a shower of trillions upon trillions of these protons and deuterons are coming off every part of the shroud man's body. Now, what are they doing? 
when they uh, fl- we call it a flux. So when that flux goes upward, right, when it reaches the shroud, remember they're charged particles, they're positively charged. They start interacting with the electrical charges, negatively charged, start interacting with the electrical charges in the shroud, uh, right at the surface of the shroud. And what do they do? When they interact, w- interact with those shroud charges, bingo, they stop. They stop right at the surface of the shroud. The velocity that they had when they were moving toward the shroud will uh, show you how darkened the image will be at that very teeny tiny spot. Now, if that is the case, that would explain three things all at once. Number one, it would explain why the image is so precise. It never spangles and goes into the other thing. The shroud image, uh, you know, is exceedingly precise. It's just like a photograph. It never, you know, spangles and goes into adjacent fibers, right? Never goes into the middle of the cloth, right? So this would, you know, it's just a, te- a like a proton. It's like teeny tiny little particle, right? So you can't even imagine how small it is. So it's just making these very precise pinpoints, if I could put it, but much smaller than a pinpoint, right? They're very precise uh, pinpoint things, which is giving you this image uh, very, very precisely. And so it also stops at the uppermost surface the fibrils won't go any further right it just stops right there and produces the friability and the image right there so we can say that the proton deuteron um, flux that is going to cause the image but at the same time there are other particles that are there they're neutrons now neutrons don't have a charge so they're not going to interact with the electrons in the material of the cloth right those neutrons are going to go zooming through the cloth And when they do zoom through the cloth, they're not just going to zoom through the cloth. They're going to zoom through the blood on the cloth. They're going to uh, actually, when they zoom through the cloth, they're going to, as we'll see in a moment, they're going to actually undermine what we call the carbonyl links there in these vertical chains uh, in the linen cloth. And the cloth is going to reconstitute itself into crystalline um, uh, uh, crystalline links, uh, which are much, much stronger which will explain the the longevity of the cloth. So the neutron flow um, uh, will then occur. So we've got the proton deuteron uh, flux that's leading, uh, it's interacting with the cloth, and that's gonna produce the friability of the image very precisely. And also we have the neutron flux, uh, which is going to strengthen the cloth. As we'll see in a moment, it's gonna make the, the blood stains on the shroud bright red. It's actually gonna have a variety of other really important effects and explain many enigmas, and which I'll explain in just a moment. Now, uh, if you take that, um, is that all that will happen when these when this huge flux is going outward? Uh, uh, there's gonna be also a boom that will happen, but a non-destructive boom and a very bright light that occurs when the flux is going outwards. So we can just say a proton deuteron flux, a neutron flux, a boom, and a bright light is what you would, if you were kind of on the scene, uh, of course you couldn't see the proton deuteron flux, you just see the effects of it. But the main thing is this is very likely what happened. One other thing that I'll just tell you is it, when you've got that kind of a radiation of the shroud, that what it's going to produce is what we call cosmogenic isotopes like chlorine 36 or calcium 41. Now, those things are not found in abundance really anywhere on the earth, only in close proximity to nuclear reactions. Mm-hmm. So if we, in the next shroud investigation, you know what the team of physicists is going to be doing. They're going to be zooming in there. They're going to be looking for um, these uh, cosmogenic isotopes. Because if they find the cosmogenic isotopes, um, uh, then as you will see in just a moment, that's going to mean that a low temperature nuclear reaction actually occurred inside that shroud. That means that the the shroud man would have disintegrated into his particle constituents where all of the particles that once constituted his body are now causing the image on the shroud, strengthening the material of the shroud and causing a series of other effects to occur. So, I mean, literally, as if we look at it from a theological point of view, as Jesus's body is moving from a physical state to its trans-physical or spiritual state, as he's moving from one state to the next, 
All of those particles, which once constituted his physical state, are not annihilated. They're simply flowing upwards and truly, uh, you know, giving rise to um, the um, uh, image. Um, he's leaving. The particles are literally making the image that we have on the shroud today. It's like he left the remnant of his physical body on the shroud to produce the image and strengthen the cloth, etc. Let me just give you a sense of why this is to be preferred over the ultraviolet, the culminated vacuum ultraviolet radiation hypothesis. Uh, there are, I'll just give you maybe six examples and you can see why this is much more preferred. First of all, as I said, it explains all 42 enigmas. Like what enigmas? Okay, let's take the first enigma on the shroud. You know, there, as I said, there are 372 blood stains on that shroud. Now let's suppose that um, the shroud was, uh, uh, the, the body was laid into the shroud. And of course, I'm not saying this, but let's suppose the apostles wanted to come in there and they were going to take the shroud off of that body, which did not, was not risen from the dead. Let's just suppose, you know, that they tried to, to swipe the shroud off the body, that they were complicit in a fraud. And so I, I'm not, of course, even suggesting this, but even if you thought that this could be the case, with a moment one of those apostles or a supposed medieval forger tried to take that cloth off of the a body with the blood that's adhering right between the body and the and the and the shroud cloth right the minute you pulled that thing off you would have fragmented segmented uh smeared and and otherwise caused great distortion in the blood stains and on almost every blood stain on the shroud. But that's not what we find. Those 372 blood stains are not fragmented, segmented, and smeared and distorted. They're in very good shape. So what does that mean? Well, that means that nobody, no human means or mechanical means, was used to pull that shroud off of a dead body. So where did... How did the shroud come off the body? The shroud uh, didn't come off the body. The body, in the particle radiation hypothesis, the body disappears. Literally, the body disintegrates from inside the shroud. And when the body disintegrates from the shroud, all of the blood adherents on the surface of the body that are not fully embedded in the cloud, uh, in, 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 the, in the cloth, would basically disappear too. They would turn into the particle constituents that are now going to be embedded uh, in the image of the shroud. So the body disappears, leaving all the blood stains intact. That explains the, one of the greatest mysteries that we have had. In other words, you know, basically we've We've been thinking all the time, how in the world could that body have gotten out there without fragmenting and destroying and smearing, distorting these blood stains? Well, that's the reason the body disappears, leaving the blood stains intact on the shroud. That because, of course, all the constituents that were connected to the body just simply disappear, and so the shroud's blood stains remain intact. Here's a second thing: we always wonder too. You know, because um, the ultraviolet radiation hypothesis does not explain how the cloth could have gotten images of the backbone and the bones inside the hands and so forth, how it could have gotten the imaging of the inside of the body onto the shroud in perfect three-dimensional proportionality. By the way, we can do that with the visual digital analyzers uh, that we borrow from NASA. And you can see it's definitely got the correct three-dimensional proportional imaging of the inside of the body to the outside flesh of the body. How could that have happened? The easy explanation is simply that if you uh, basically look at that body, right, and you... <clears throat> And uh, you can imagine for just a second, now all of the particles, the seven octillion atoms are simultaneously disintegrating. So all these particles are going up. What are going to be the first particles to leave the body? The ones on the surface. So they, you know, take, you know, they don't have any distance to travel between the backbone, say, and the surface of the flesh. They go directly from the flesh into the cloth. 
So the ones that are closest are already gone. Well, if they're gone by the time the particles from the backbone or the hand bones and so forth are getting to the cloth, the way is cleared. So in other words, there's nothing to impede the flow of those particles that are now coming from inside the body. They've got a free, clear pathway where they can go right up, you know, just a split second later, they will embed themselves in the cloth. That's how the imaging from the um, body, uh, the inside of the body, gets on the cloth with perfect three-dimensional proportionality. Again, the particle radiation hypothesis explains it. Vacuum ultraviolet radiation hypothesis does not. Let me just give you three or four more examples, and the point will be well made. But as I said, all 42 enigmas on the cloth are explained. We always wondered, too, hey, how come the imaging on the dorsal side and the imaging on the frontal side of the cloth are of equal intensity. I mean, you know, just from a physicist's point of view, the body with all of its gravity, you know, affecting it, right? The body is laying, the backside of the body is laying on top of the shroud. You should have <clears throat> greater intensity of that image than the front part of <clears throat> the cloth, which is just lying lightly on top of the shroud it's not, and in many cases, not even touching uh, uh, whole parts of the body. So how in the world could you have equal intensity of those images? Well, in a nuclear reaction, even a low temperature nuclear reaction, a vacuum is created. And when a vacuum is created, what does a vacuum do? It pulls the two back part of the cloth, the dorsal part and the frontal part of the cloth, it pulls it toward the center at equal intensities. So in other words, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the two parts of the cloth are being pulled toward the center at equal intensity. So the gravity of the body laying on top of the shroud is negated. So that's, you know, again, we could never get it. And now we get it. Let me just give a couple more examples. You notice on the shroud that the blood stains on the shroud are like bright red. Now that just does not correspond uh, to normal histopathological responses of blood, right? So in other words, if you take blood and you put it out in like air, notice that it will go from uh, bright red to dull red to brown and ultimately to black. So the blood stains turn black. Now you look at the shroud and there's not a black blood stain on there. <clears throat> They're all bright red. For a while there, people that, well, maybe it's high bilirubin content, but that can't be because, of course, the bilirubin content fluctuates from place to place. And, you know, and of course, it can't explain why they turn bright red. But then when the uh, particle radiation hypothesis came, the explanation became clear. Uh, and several Italian uh, physicists actually showed that when you irradiate blood with neutrons, and remember, there's a neutron flux. <clears throat> All these neutron, neutrons are flowing out of the body into the cloth, but they're not just flowing uh, into and through the cloth. They're flowing into and through the blood, and they're irradiating the blood as they're going through it. Now, if you take a look, if you irradiate blood with neutrons, and then you put it into ultraviolet light, Right. So like, let's suppose the shroud is on exhibition and there's ultraviolet light from the sun and the exhibition windows. You irradiate that with neutrons, put it into an atmosphere with ultraviolet light. What do all those blood stains do? Not just on the shroud, but anywhere. They turn bright red. And of course, here again, we have an explanation of something we just could never get. And then, you know, I mean, the shroud, let's face facts. If the shroud is 2,000 years old, that's the best and strongest linen shroud that existed in human history. How are you going to explain why it is so resistant to solvents, so resistant to age, so resistant to water, so resistant to touching and kissing, so resistant uh, to all of the various things which were probably used to try and clean it at various points? How could the shroud have, you know, gone through all of that for 2,000 years and still be at almost in really tip-top condition. 
How did that happen? It's those neutrons all over again. When the neutrons, remember, they pass through the linen cloth. So when those neutrons are zooming through the cloth, they're breaking up all the linear linear carbonyl links that are in the cloth because that's very typical of um, you know linen, very typical of of, of uh, you know a flax cloth. So uh, you know you basically um, have those neutrons going through, breaking up the linear links, which are links which are very kind of weaker. And then when they reconstitute themselves, many of them reconstitute themselves as crystalline links, which are really tough, resistant, strong links. And so that cloth becomes uh, quite resistant uh, to, um, you know, uh, uh, as I said, not just age, but solvents and touching and so forth. So anyway, these are just but a few of the enigmas explained. We got 42 enigmas on the image and the blood and the, um, uh, and the, uh, uh, the cloth itself. All 42 are explained by the particle radiation hypothesis. So if I were a betting man and I would bet on this, because I think the evidence is very clear, I would say in the next shroud investigation, the first thing everybody, all the physicists are going to do is look for those cosmogenic isotopes. And if they find the chlorine 36 and the calcium 41, et cetera, et cetera, if they find all these things um, uh, in this shroud, which of course is not found in really any abundance on earth except near by a place of a nuclear um, uh, radiation emission, a uh, strong nuclear radiation emission, then um, I would say that that shroud, um, the image occurred by a, a nuclear uh, reaction, a, a low temperature nuclear reaction, which caused the simultaneous disintegration of every stable atomic nucleus uh, in that um, uh, uh, shroud and if, if that occurred, you know, remember there's seven octillion of them. That's a miracle. I'm telling you, the odds of a simultaneous disintegration of seven octillion um, uh, perfectly stable atomic nuclei, um, and that's about in the neighborhood of about a trillion, 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 just multiply it times itself 10 times. To one. In other words, it's about 10 to the 120th to one that that's going to happen. And you know what? If that happened just one day, uh, I don't think so. Uh, that's a miracle. And it's a deliberate miracle. It's, you know, not just a miracle, um, you know, that, that uh, for no apparent reason, it's a miracle uh, that occurs so that the physical body of Jesus will not just disappear, but will be embedded into the shroud to make the very image that um, uh, of the, the man uh, who was uh, contained in it. And of course, if that were the case, if we could show the cosmogenic isotopes, there'd be no doubt that it was produced by a miracle. There'd be no doubt that it is Jesus Christ, because of course, the apostles reported that his body had been transformed into, as Paul would call it, into spirit and power and glory, you know, um, uh, you know, and we will become uh, like him, for we too shall be him as he is. Wow, Father, my my, my mind is blown away. <laughs> I see here in the chat that a lot of people are are also amazed. There's also uh, uh, information that I have not heard before. Obviously, you, you have studied studied the shroud for a long time. Um, uh -huh. it, it it reminds me of on uh, the. Uh, the, the Mount of Transfiguration, I would imagine what type of yeah. power or effect that it would have, right? So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I do yeah. have a, a brother, uh, uh, Empire. Um, he had a question that I would think was very interesting. Let me okay. see where it go. Uh, he says here, I have a question for later. Is it true that the Lord is standing upright in the image on the on the cloth? I just wanted that. What is the consensus? So I don't know if you have. A, well, a here is the difficulty. There is a hypothesis that gives some, um, uh, you know, potential possible evidence that that could have been the case. The difficulty is that the, the variance in the imaging that causes that interpretation of uh, you know the body either moving or standing upright on the cloth. Uh, has many, many different interpretations, especially the fall of the hair and other kinds of things. We can't definitively say 
that that is the way that happened. It is one possible interpretation uh, of explaining how the fall of the hair uh, occurred this way. But then, you know, the, the very precise uh, imaging, uh, you know, presupposing a linear columnated um, expression of the particle hits uh, would tend to mitigate against that. Um, you know, but uh, there's much more research that is to be done. So for the uh, person who asked that question, best response is um, much more needs to be done to certainly validate that explanation. But there does seem to be some evidence that would mitigate, um, that would militate against it. So, um, so I would uh, keep that one in brackets for the time being and stick with the real evidence, the good stuff that we have. And we have a lot of very good evidence of the particle radiation <laughs> hypothesis. And I think there are other explanations for especially the lay of the hair, um, you know, that um, we might be able to, to do without uh, postulating that the body is moving upright. Right. So, so just the amount of details and amount of, of evidence that has come forth from Claude, it's it's impossible to make a forge out of this. Like, how are you going to, it's not possible. It's as far as I am concerned, uh, certainly not even a 21st century forger could have made this occur. I, first of all, how would you ever, let's suppose you crucified a guy in the exact way you found in the gospels and you did it with great technical skill, right? The, the, the point of course is, you would have to, to do this um, in a way where you could get the body, the shroud separated from the body without destroying the blood stains. Good luck. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Uh, I defy anybody to even hypothesize a method through which that occurs. The only one I've ever heard of that satisfied the physicists and the chemists that have examined the shroud, and there are many, is that the body had to disappear completely. That is to say, with all of the blood that was uh, adhering to the body had to disappear along with the body, leaving the blood on the shroud autonomous and, you know, un, you know, unfragmented, segmented and distorted by itself. So, I mean, I don't think a forger could have ever done that. I don't think it's possible. And by the way, uh, frankly, I just don't think, how are you going to get the imaging of the, the blood onto the shroud with perfect anatomical accuracy without an image. Give me a break. Yeah, even the most skilled forger today, but a medieval forger, give me a break. Impossible. I mean, you know, these are the kinds of things that, you know, as you look at the crucifixion, I mean, look at that spear wound. Okay, now tell me that the medieval forger knew that the legionnaire spear had an elliptical head. You know, uh, there's no remnant of legionnaire spears that were around in the Middle Ages. Uh, he probably thought it was a pointed spear, like a medieval spear. But the idea <clears throat> that you've got an elliptical head, and then you can see, actually see on the shroud where the wound of the spear is, you can see that it goes up at that 30 degree angle and then it's going right toward the, you know, the, uh, the cardial, the pericardial sac that surrounds the heart, right? And it's going to go zooming up and nick that heart. And then as it goes up and nicks the heart, the next thing it's going to do is go right into the pleural sac. Now, as you pull that, the legionnaire, the soldier pulls the spear out, right? You can see that the first thing that will squirt out is blood from the nicked heart, followed by what looks like clear fluid, the pleural fluid coming from the pleural, the pleural sac, and it's just going to pull and squirt out right afterwards. Now you look at that wound right there. And you can see the first of all the the blood in the center, and you can see the pleural the pleural fluid, which is surrounding the blood. Now you think that a medieval forger could have pulled this one off? I mean, heck, for the longest time, people thought that the Johannine interpretation outflow of blood and water. Remember from John's Gospel. They, and of course, then the, the gospel writer says, oh yeah, and this is written by a person who saw this and he knows that what he saw is true, blah, blah, blah. So he's insisting <clears throat> that the blood and the, the transparent fluid that he thinks is water came out of that wound. 
Well, we see the evidence of what was the water, <clears throat> but now we see that it's plural, that it's plural fluid, and we know, um, you know, that uh, that is definitely um, uh, would have come from the correct angle between the fifth and the sixth ribs, going up at the thirty degree angle right into the uh, cavity uh, for the heart and the lungs, and we know that that's pro very probably what happened. And then when he jerks it out, out squirts the blood. So the idea then. Um, is uh, how could a forger have known this? And by the way, uh, you know, what kind of a whip was used to whip Jesus? I mean, uh, it's, it's a Roman flagrum. Well, Roman flagrum has three thongs, and each one of those thongs has these little lead dumbbells, right? Little teeny lead dumbbells on the end of the thong. So as you're whipping this guy, right, and um, he's whipped 39 times, and of course, there's three lashes for each time he's whipped. There's a, a soldier to the left and there's a soldier to the right. And they are whipping him alternatively, then back and forth, right? You can see what's happening <clears throat> is that these lead dumbbells are literally sinking into the sides of the man. Then when the soldier pulls the whip back, it shreds the flesh. So he's <clears throat> losing tremendous amounts of blood. Now, uh, you say, well, how come Jesus died in three hours <clears throat> on the cross? Why it was He was a very strong and tall man. You can tell from the image on the shroud. Why would he die in three hours? Blood loss, blood loss from the spear wound, blood loss from the dislocated uh, shoulder, that he has on the right side, and especially blood loss from those whippings. And of course, by the time you are done, um, you can see he was a mess. And, uh, you know, um, uh, and if you can, how would a media forger know about a Roman flagrum? How would he know about the lead dumbbells at the end of the thong? How, you know, <laughs> I've got to tell you, I mean, no way, Jose. And, and then finally, of course, you, you start looking at, you know, um, other things like how did the forger know, right? We only can see the entrance wound of the nail on, uh, I mean, the exit wound of the nail on the hand. <clears throat> For a long time, Pierre Barbette, he thought that the nail went through the wrist because the exit wound shows the nail coming out right there, right? So you think to yourself, oh, it must have gone straight through. Well, it didn't go straight through. As uh, Frederick Zugabe proved, that basically the nail goes in the palm and then it follows the track of, you see this little uh, uh, curve part here, it's following the track of the thenar furrow and it's going right down into the region of this whole complex of nerves right at the base of the wrist. And that's where it exits, exactly where we see on the shroud. And that's what's adhering the hand to the wood Oh, no, <clears throat> we know that this, you know, couldn't have been anticipated uh, by, you know, a medieval forger uh, to, to, you know, put it down the thenar furrow, unless the medieval forger was getting into nailing hands uh, for, uh, you know, lots of dead cadavers in a scientific way over the course of a, a long time. But the point I'm trying to get to is, are you kidding me? I mean, this is no possible way, in my opinion. I don't call anything impossible, but I'll just say this. There's not even a one in a, you know, 10 to the, you know, 100th chance that this is a forgery. I think that the whole thing is preposterous. And, you know, the two Italian, you know, so-called blood specialists who had no specialty in blood at all, a Garla Shelley and company. I think that's just, uh, it's uh, it, the fact that it's still out there on the web, you know, these two uh, uh, guys who are, you know, most scientifically, uh, uh, you know, horrible, uh, you know, uh, experiment ever done in non-controlled settings, you know, using sponges on a reed, you know, and, and dumping it, you know, onto the body to get blood flows. I mean, you got to be kidding me. I mean, this is amateur hour. So anyway, I, I, I got to tell you, I look at this and I think to myself, is this a really authentic shroud? Is this the authentic burial shroud of Jesus? I think it just, if, if the particle radiation hypothesis is proved, Without a doubt in my mind, it is not only the shroud of Jesus, but it is a miracle 
of immense proportions that took place um, in order to leave the remnants of Jesus's body um, in the actual shroud to produce the image of what he looked like when he was crucified, pure and simple. We've got his body still with us, not just in his blood, but in the image on the shroud. That's my belief. Wow. I, I have to rewatch this stream again. The, the details that you just brought in was amazing. Um, well, what can you tell us about the, the pollen grains? Like, first of all, what is it? And what, what kind of uh, amazing information can we derive from that, that type of data? Yeah, you had asked me earlier about the Shroud's journey, and I, I uh, uh, sort of did not do that question, but now is the right time. Uh, yeah, pollen grains are embedded in, in um, the Shroud, and there's a proliferation of them. And about two-thirds of those pollen grains come from the area of northern Judea and Jerusalem. By the way, this is not going to be important just for the placement of where the Shroud originated. This is going to be important also for um, uh, the actual dating of the Shroud. It's another piece of evidence along with the four new dating tests and uh, another piece of evidence along with uh, Tristan Casabianca's uh, debunking of the 1988 carbon dating, etc. So let's just take a look at uh, these shrouds. So we've got these pollen fossils and, we, and they surely will tell us where the shroud has been. Two thirds of those pollen grains, they come from, uh, by the way, these were amassed first by um, a Swiss criminologist and uh, uh, a botanist named uh, uh, Max Fry, and Max Fry uh, basically, um, uh, you know, had a series of colleagues who have, um, you know, extended the research that he began uh, in the you know in 1978 Stirp investigation and following. So there's been a lot of a lot of research done. This is not like haphazard. There were sticky tapes taken 1978 of practically every square centimeter on that shroud. So we've got a pretty good idea of you know the pollen grains that were there and where they came from. Two thirds came from Northern Judea and Jerusalem. Then we have another proliferation um, uh, from uh, um, uh, um, Edessa, Turkey, excuse me. And um, then we have another proliferation from Constantinople. Uh, and the least uh, great proliferation uh, is from Liri, France and Turin, Italy. Uh, that's where the shroud was over the, uh, the last 700 years. So we, we have a provenance uh, for the shroud going back to around 1350 when um, uh, Geoffrey de Charnay uh, announced that he had the shroud uh, and um, uh, and I'll talk about the journey of the shroud in just a moment but for that 700 years uh, we do have pollen grains um, that are there from Turin and from um, uh, Liri France and other places in France however that's the least number let's go back to our northern Judea and Jerusalem pollen grains those pollen grains, um, uh, 14 of them are indigenous to Jerusalem and northern Judea. So we rarely find them uh, outside of that. And four of those pollen grains have never, ever been found anywhere on the earth except <clears throat> northern Judea and Jerusalem. So what are the odds that our medieval forger got a hold of the shroud and said, I know all of the indigenous and um, all of the unique pollen grains from the Middle East, Northern Judea and Jerusalem, and I'm going to embed them in a strong proliferation in the shroud. Zero. That did not occur. So, I, I mean, again, I, it just rules out the idea <coughs> of a medieval a forger or any introduction of pollen fossils after the shroud was, uh, the picture had been taken and the scientific investigation had begun. So what's the next largest proliferation, as I said, from Edessa, Turkey, and then from Constantinople? So first of all, what does that tell us about the shroud's origin? The shroud's very probable origin would have to be Northern Judea and Jerusalem. And not only would it have originated there, but that linen cloth had to have been in the open air in that region for a long time. We're talking centuries. 
So that's where your biggest proliferation is. That's where your unique grains are. Very probably that's the long, that's a very long period of time. And the shroud was in the open air. There was no reason to protect it, put it in an enclosed surface because it was uh, sitting out there before um, it was put on Jesus's body. And then, of course, when they took it uh, from the tomb and kept it stored, they were not using uh, you know, uh, hermetically sealed containers. So, I mean, the, the idea is that's a very probable origin point. And then, of course, um, that gets us back to the dating of the shroud. Hey, um, let's take a look at that for just one second. If the shroud is only 700 years old, and we know that the shroud was in Leary, France, Chambéry, France, um, and, uh, and uh, Turin, Italy, for those 700 years, that's where the shroud was. We have a, a historical provenance, very definite for those 700 years in France and Italy. Now, how in the world <clears throat> the shroud should have proliferation of, of pollen grains all from Leary, France, Tembury, and from Turin, Italy? <clears throat> That's where we ought to have them. But in point of fact, no. We actually have a proliferation from Jerusalem, northern Judea, Edessa, and Constantinople. Give me a break. The shroud couldn't be only 700 years old because it has to have had a couple of centuries in Jerusalem and northern Judea at the very least. It had to have a, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, been in uh, the area of Edessa, Turkey for a couple of centuries at the very least, and in Constantinople, uh, you know, at, at the very least. The least proliferation is from Leary and Turin, Italy. So let's start with that. 700 years out of the question. You could have never gotten those pollen grains into the shroud, uh, you know, if the shroud were only 700 years old. So that joins up with the new dating tests and the Casabianca stuff. The shroud is no way 700 years old. Plus, of course, it wasn't stored at burning hot temperatures, you know, for 24-7 of its existence. So putting that all together, that gives us one clue about the date and the origin. So where was the shroud's journey? Where did it go? The next place it very probably went to is Edessa, Turkey. And Edessa, Turkey is a, a, a good candidate because we know um, that um, a, a, an icon called the Mandelian suddenly appears in Edessa around 400 AD. Now, the Mandelian is thought to be the Shroud of Turin, which is folded up. And you can actually see that the shroud was folded up. Um, you know, uh, John Jackson and his group using special uh, X-ray um, spectrometry, they were able to actually show the creases there uh, in the, uh, uh, the remnant of the creases that are in the shroud. So we know that it was folded up and probably it was put into a frame and the frame was clumped down on the edges of the shroud so that only the face would be showing the mandelian was the face of jesus and it was paraded around um edessa turkey and it was called of course called the face of jesus or the um you know uh, some uh, uh you know the, the mandelian is a technical term that was used uh, and it was paraded around edessa now why do you know of course that correlates because the second biggest proliferation of pollen grains are from um, Edessa, Turkey. <clears throat> so we know it was there, <clears throat> and we know it was there for a fairly long period of time. That being the case, why? what's the corroborating evidence? The iconography of Jesus suddenly changes in what place? Edessa, Turkey. Before the Edessa Mandelian changed the iconography, of um, uh, uh, Jesus's features, basically Jesus was portrayed as a round-faced Roman, but that's what not what we see coming out of Edessa. So the icons out of Edessa, influenced by the Mandelian, show him with an elongated face, just like the shroud, an elongated Semitic face. Not only that, but the iconography of Jesus prior to um, the uh, Mantillion, he is a short-haired Roman and a clean-shaven Roman. But that's not what um, the Mandelian and the uh, Edessa iconography suggests. They show Jesus with long hair and a beard, a long beard and a mustache, just as we see on the shroud. Semitic features, not Roman features. 
also we can see that big, huge, open box scar above Jesus's nose that shows up in many of the Edessa icons. Uh, and of course, that's what we see exactly. That scar uh, above Jesus' nose, that's what we see on the shroud. Paul Vignon, by the way, discovered all of these uh, various um, uh, differences in the iconographic, um, iconographic features. So then, of course, you see the rise, raised eyebrow. The man on the shroud got punched very, very hard in the face. And when he got punched, it caused a slight contusion above the eyebrow, which forced the eyebrow up, right? And so you can actually see um, that this uh, raised eyebrow is there in the iconography. So when you put all of these things together, right, and you see all of these distinctive features on the shroud that wind up being on the iconography that's, um, that is uh, influenced by the Mendelian, then it's probably very secure. And I think it's a... Um, um, you know, it's highly probable that the Mandelian was the shroud uh, that was folded up and the creases that are there suggest very strongly that it was done. Now, we also know that the emperor of Constantinople got jealous of Edessa for having the Mandelian. So what did he do? Like the godfather, he made the, uh, Edessa a deal they couldn't refuse. He surrounds uh, the town and he basically says, look, I'm going to give you a real fair price, whatever it was, you know, several hundred thousand, you know, gold pieces or silver pieces or whatever it was. And uh, you guys can release that the Mandelian to me or I'm going to crush you. And uh, they said, well, we'll take the money. So, of course, uh, they took the money. And, of course, as you would expect, the shroud goes to Constantinople. Now, when it goes to Constantinople, we know that it very probably went to the church of St. Mary Blacharnay. You know, so how, why do we think it went to St. Mary Blacharnay? Because Robert de Clary, uh, Robert de Clary was a, um, a knight in the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, Crusades. Uh, he comes, uh, he says, I went to the basement of this church, St. Mary Blacharnay. I went to the basement and um, I was showed, uh, shown the, um, the, the, sh the, um, the, he doesn't say the Mandelian, but the face of Christ. I saw it, the cloth fully unfurled. I saw it, um, you know, and it's full length and he's, he describes it perfectly. It's, you know, you can see the, the man's head going, uh, you know, from the, the back part of the head and from the, Head, you can see the front part of the body. You can see the frontal and the dorsal images about 14 feet tall, right? And so forth and so on. He's describing the shroud exactly as he would have seen it. He says it has the blood of our Savior on the shroud. So I think Robert de Clary definitely saw the shroud um, down there in the basement of St. Mary Blacharnay. Now comes the mysterious part. So I think it was in Constantinople, just like the pollen grains indicate. So then the final thing is, well, how did it get to Liri, France? How does it get uh, into the hands of Geoffrey de, Char uh, Geoffrey de Charnay? I think there is a relative of Jeanne de Vergy. Jeanne de Vergy is the wife of um, um, uh, Geoffrey de Charnay. And Jeanne de Vergy is a fifth generation, a fifth generation um, a relative of um, a man by the name of Autan de la Roche. Autan de la Roche is a head, <clears throat> is a head of a, a large regiment in the Fourth Crusade. Now he um, uh, basically, probably, um, is what um, you know the historians believe. Uh, Autan de la Roche gets in his and basically into the church, probably sees the, the shroud or the Mandelian there, and he swipes it. Basically, he takes it and um, he brings it back to France. But because the Pope had condemned anybody who stole any relics, right, from, um, from Constantinople or from the East, uh, with that condemnation, uh, you know, Geoffrey de Charnay, he, uh, I mean, uh, the relatives of Geoffrey de Charnay's wife, Jeanne de Vergy, they couldn't say anything. So Autan de la Roche uh, either keeps it himself or gives it to somebody. 
But the main thing is nobody discloses that they have it because, of course, the penalties that would have come from um, a relic looters of the East uh, would have been really disastrous uh, because of the Pope's strong condemnation of it. So it, kept, it stays hidden for about five generations. Then suddenly, um, uh, it must have been presented to Jean de Vergy because Geoffrey de Charnay in around 1350s, they said, he comes up and says, I've got the cloth and I've got this burial cloth of Jesus. And he's very insistent that it's the real thing. And of course, the rest, is, is the rest as they say, is history. Thank you. <clears throat> so, Father, um, are there any um, research planned on the Shroud in the near future? Is there something about the cosmogenic isotopes? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is in the future for the Shroud? Oh, the Shroud is simply... Uh, obviously, an, an appeal has been made to three parties, uh, you know, the um, uh, the Savoy family, um, who uh, technically is a part owner uh, to, uh, you know, the church, uh, the Catholic Church, a uh, part owner of the Shroud, and to the city of uh, Turin, Italy. Uh, they have some kind of custodial function uh, in, the, in the midst of all of these things. Obviously, uh, you know, um, trying we have to get uh, an agreement from all three parties on uh, this, uh, you know, the stipulations for uh, when the, the an, an exhibition or scientific, um, you know, a testing could be done, how uh, that would proceed, what kinds of cautions would be needed, which kinds of scientists are going to be involved. And there just have to be, you know, you cannot do uh, like what happened um, at the, the removal of the sample in 1988 for the 1988 carbon dating. I mean, you have to have some friendly scientists that are there overlooking what other scientists are doing. And you have to have some hostile scientists there overlooking what friendly scientists are doing. But you can't just have so-called neutral scientists who turn out not to be neutral, who are pulling you know, samples of the shroud from the most controversial corners et cetera, et cetera. That is just not right. So the point, of course, is we're going to have to agree on the scientists, the constituencies, the kinds of tests that are to be done, you know, what's going to be removed from the shroud, et cetera. And of course, the investigation for cosmogenic isotopes are going to have to start looking for radiation content of very specialized varieties, which will require special instruments and so forth and so on. So once I think there is agreement on all of these things, I think there will be another significant um, test that's done on the shroud. And uh, as I said, I would not at all be surprised to find cosmogenic isotopes embedded in the shroud, at least in some clear abundance. And I would bet that we can validate the um, other enigmatic features of the shroud that we now know can be explained by um, the particle radiation hypothesis that we can have further collabor uh, corroborative validation um, as well. So uh, anyway, uh, that uh, when will that be? <laughs> Whenever we can get some agreement on what's going to happen. And no, uh, you know, I mean, obviously the Catholic Church and the city of Turin and the Savoy family, uh, not everybody's in full agreement from the beginning. So it's probably take a little di diplo diplomacy to get everything rigged up right. <laughs> I, I can understand that, that there are some powers who would like to stop all the further research on the show. With, with all the amazing uh -huh. evidence that we already have, you already gave us, which were which is amazing uh -huh. here. So it's understandable from the devil's uh, from the devil's side. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you can imagine, if you know, uh, if, if the the evil spirit wants to get us. Uh, is uh, uh, paw into, you know, uh, something on this earth. That's one of the things he's got a priority. That's on the top of his priority list. So anyway, I'll just Absolutely. leave it there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, th th there, were, there were so many details that you have given us. There were so many facts. There were so many corroborating research that you have given us, Father. Thank you very much for the work that you do in general. Thank you very much for edifying us. Um, any Christian, right, is edified more because of you. So, my sincere gra gratitude for everything. 
Is there anything that you'd like to to leave us with? Well, um, if I might, if this was intriguing to you, sure. uh, there is um, a website called MajusCenter.com. That's spelled M-A-G-I-S Center.com. Uh, the vast majority of things on the Maja Center are free of charge. Uh, take a look at some of those videos on the Shroud. Uh, you can get um, some of those things. Uh, I would also look at um, uh, the official website of the Shroud of Turin. That is um, shroud.com. Uh, so take a look at that uh, website as well, which has generally very good um, information, which is, um, you know, edited from a scientific point of view to make sure that nothing's too uh, off the wall. And then um, uh, I'm going to have a book coming out um, uh, of, uh, you know, in March uh, from Ignatius Press called uh, Science at the Doorstep to Christ. Uh, the whole of chapter um, three of that book, which is a very lengthy chapter, has uh, all of the scientific tests that I've just described uh, explained in detail with all the research articles given in the footnotes. And then uh, there is a fine book uh, from Sophia Press as well uh, that's out right now. It's, um, it's on Eucharistic miracles, uh, really, but it's, it's by Frank, uh, Franco uh, Serafini. Um, and that book um, is called A Cardiologist Examines um, uh, the, uh, uh, Jesus, um, you know, a look at the uh, stupefying um, uh, evidence for um, uh, the Eucharistic miracles. It's a really fine, excellent scientific work. But in the, um, the uh, chapter on the blood, uh, uh, you know, uh, Serafini does a very fine job connecting uh, the blood, well, first on just looking at examining the blood itself and all the work that Heller and Adler and all those guys did, um, you know, a uh, uh, Bologna as well, and on the, um, on the uh, 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 blood, but um, uh, he connects that blood also uh, to the blood of these Eucharistic miracles. So those might be some other sources you could get. Obviously, bondagecenter.com, um, that's uh, free of charge, shroud.com, free of charge. Thank you, Father. Also amazing to hear for all the books that are that are coming out, and obviously, um, first of all, if Christ wills and if you're willing as well, perhaps in the future, that you also could do on the Eucharistic miracles, which would which would also be uh, something of interest yeah. for me. Absolutely, I could do it, and uh, uh, that's also in the same book. It's in chapter four of of that uh, uh, same book, Science at the Doorstep to Christ, and there's information on the Maja Center website, MajaCenter.com. Excellent. My, my, my sincere gratitude. Thank you, everybody, for, for watching, for being here. That it may be obviously a blessing for, for everybody of you. Wishing you nothing all but the best. Glory be to God alone. Bye, guys.